I'm gonna show you exactly how I made this brisket on my offset smoker. <laughs> that is so good. I'm sharing every secret and trick I know, so if you stick around until the end, I promise you will blow your friends and family away with your next barbecue brisket. So I'm cooking a 12 pound prime Costco brisket. And for my beginner viewers, I can totally understand if you want a play by play on how to trim a brisket because the trim is one of the most important parts of the brisket cooking process. So if you need it, you can check out my brisket 101 video, which will be linked in the description where I give a detailed guide on how I trim my brisket. But for the more advanced pit masters, I'm gonna just give a broad overview on how I trim brisket. So remove the pointy edges of the brisket, take off the big hunks of fat, remove the thin parts of the brisket, brisket and then even out the fat on all sides of the brisket. Then season your brisket to your liking. I'm doing this jerby style so that's pepper, salt, and then Lowry seasoning. And this brisket is ready for the pit when I fire it up first thing in the morning. So I'm using my 250 gallon smoker for this cook, but for any offset that you're using, fire management is another super important factor of the cooking process. In the next few weeks, I will release a video that's specifically talking about fire management and all the nuances about that. So be on the lookout for that. But for this video, I'm just gonna be giving a general overview of fire management. So first of all, make sure to use a really good hard wood like pecan, oak, or hickory. This way your splits will produce a lot less ash because ash can kind of choke up your fire inside of the firebox. Also, you want to make sure that your flames are nice and low throughout the cook and to help maintain the flames, you want to adjust the dampers on the firebox and also the smokestack because that'll help regulate the airflow. If you run a nice low fire, then you can cook your briskets anywhere between 250 to 300 degrees Fahrenheit with no problems. As long as you keep in mind three factors for your brisket, which are bark formation, fat rendering and collagen breakdown. So my entire brisket cooking process is based on these three factors. So I can't really give you a time when the brisket will be done. It'll be done when it's done. But let's go through each of these three key factors so I can show you what I look for. For our first factor, the bark formation, you not only want the bark or crust of the meat to set, but you also want it to have a really dark color, almost black. But in order to achieve this, we have to understand how the bark forms on the meat. This is done by a process called the Maillard reaction reaction, which is a reaction between protein, sugars, and heat. A brisket already has sugars and proteins in it, so when you start to cook it and it starts to get brown, that is the Maillard reaction in process. Another factor of the Maillard reaction is that the surface of the meat must be dry. So do not spritz your brisket just because it's starting to look dry because you're essentially stopping the bark formation from happening. You should only use the spritz to cool down parts of the brisket that are getting too crispy so that the whole thing can finish evenly and at the same time, no parts burn. Another note on spritzing, if you scalped your brisket like I did, as you can see on these uh, spots because of uh, carelessness, then uh, make sure to spritz those parts because they tend to dry out really quickly. And also another thing is that I sliced into my brisket when I was trimming it to make sure that I was hitting the fat cap at the level I wanted. And I went a little too deep. So as you can see, a lot of the juice from the brisket is flowing out. So just make sure every 10, 15 minutes, you kind of tip it over, let the juices come out. And then that'll make sure that, uh, you know, these lighter parts of the bark will develop as well and it won't leave like a super bad patch on the brisket once it's done. Because we want the meat to dry to speed up the Maillard reaction, using a offset smoker is already a huge advantage because it cooks with convection. But here are some other tricks I use to speed up the bark formation. The first trick is using the damper. So not only does using the damper slow down the draw effect in our smoker, giving us those nice low flames we were talking about earlier, but it also allows the smoke in the cook chamber to slow down and really saturate into the meat, giving us a really Really nice color early on in the cook. Another trick I do is I dry brine my brisket by seasoning it the night before my cook. The dry brine pulls the moisture out of the meat and lets it reabsorb into it so that the surface of the meat is dry when I'm ready to cook. With these two tricks alone, the bark on my offset brisket are usually done by hour four or five. But if you want more tricks on how to speed up bark formation, I'll have a video linked in the description where I show you seven tricks on how to get a dark bark on your brisket. So after setting the bark on the brisket, the next key factor I'm looking for is fat rendering. And since offsets cook with the movement of hot air over the briskets, I highly recommend you cook with your briskets fat side up. This is so that the fat can render effectively since it's facing the source of the heat. And at the same time, it's easier to check if the fat is rendered since it's on top of the brisket. So the fat rendering for me usually happens well after the bark has already been set on the brisket and it's super easy to test. Just press your finger on the brisket and your finger should go through really easily and the fat should be nice, pillowy, and sticky. If it is, then the second factor is complete. Now on to the third and 
final factor that I'm looking for, which is the collagen breakdown. So specifically the collagen that we're trying to break down is inside of the point muscle and also in that thick band of fat and connective tissue that connects the point muscle to the flat muscle. To help illustrate what I mean by break down, then I want you to look at your brisket about an hour after you put it on the smoker. Now poke that thick band of fat and connective tissue that I just talked about right under the mohawk on the fat side of the brisket. You'll see that this part is kind of like rubber and it just bounces your finger back. As we get into the later stages of the cook, the collagen in this band of connective tissue will break down into gelatin once it reaches 180 degrees Fahrenheit. And the fat in there will also break down a lot earlier as we mentioned before, and that'll be starting at the 140 degree Fahrenheit mark. Once the fat and collagen has completely broken down, this once bouncy substance will turn into jelly and rendered fat. And there's a super easy way to tell if the connective band has become jelly, and I got this trick from Texicana Barbecue. Just pick up your brisket right in the middle and push your fingers into the center of the brisket. You should feel that band that was once elastic and bouncy just completely give away to your fingers. And once that happens, you know that this brisket is done so you can pull it and rest it. With this technique, you don't even have to temp your briskets, but by the time they're ready to pull, they're usually around the 180s to the 210s. And because of this large range, most pros don't use a thermometer because you can't rely on it because every brisket is different. And you can do this test whether you wrap your brisket or you don't. I wrapped my brisket in butcher paper and also added some beef tallow to the top of it so that I can finish the cook a lot faster than if I went unwrapped. And at the same time, I really like the shine that the beef tallow puts on the brisket once it's done and ready to slice. But if you do wrap like me, make sure you don't use too much butcher paper because if you use too much, it'll be really hard to tell if the connective tissue has broken down when you feel for it. And also if you wrap, make sure to put the brisket fat side up on the cooker because we don't want all of that tallow that we just put in the wrap to wash off the bark on the fat cap that we developed over all these hours. Now, before we open up this brisket and slice it up to serve, I need to talk about something controversial but essential, the rest. So to preface this, yes, a rest is absolutely necessary. If you do not rest your brisket, when you cut into it, all the juice will escape onto the cutting board and it will dry out your brisket in minutes that we just spent like half the day cooking. But for me, the only reason why I rest is for two reasons. The first is to get the brisket to a good slicing temperature, which in my experience is around 140 degrees. And the second is to have the brisket ready at the time I wanna slice it. So if I need the brisket done in a couple of hours, just like this cook, then I just make sure that when I'm finishing up the brisket when it's wrapped that the connective tissue is completely broken down and then I just put it on the counter and wait until it reaches that 140 and in the opposite spectrum if I need the brisket in like 15 hours then I'll pull the brisket early at like 180 and then put it directly in the warming oven at 140 and then just let it climb down slowly the brisket will carry over cook in the oven and it will actually raise the internal temperature about five degrees before it slowly cascades down to that 140 over that 15 hour period the long slow rest will ensure that the color collagen has enough time to break down and also keep the meat nice and moist until it's ready to serve. And as a side note, I'll say that if you are planning to do a long rest to make sure that you're using a prime grade brisket, that'll just make sure that the flat doesn't dry out while it's resting. But I just treat these two scenarios as the top and the bottom of my gauge and then just adjust my strategy however long I need to rest it. And that's it. I honestly don't believe there's a secret rest time that you have to follow to make a really good brisket. I think the differences between a super long rest rest time and a short one are pretty negligible. And this might be controversial or upset some of you guys out there, but this is just from my experience. During the cooking process, I already got the dark bark, the fat's completely rendered, the collagen's already broken down. The rest isn't adding any more value to the brisket. It's just getting it to a slicing temperature. Okay, and now it's time for the big reveal so we can slice this brisket up. This video is much more of a brisket principles guide versus a how-to video, so I am not gonna be doing a step-by-step -step on how I slice brisket. But for my beginner audience, I will have a link to a video on how I slice brisket in the description for your reference. Anyways, for slicing, just make sure that you're cutting against the grain of the meat. And you can see which way the grain is going by lifting up the brisket and seeing the lean side. Also a reminder, a brisket is two separate muscles, the point and the flat. So while you're slicing, just make sure to maneuver your knife so that you continue to cut against the grain. So this already looks way different than the last brisket I did where the flat was burnt on one side. So I think that was attributed to keeping the flames very low for the majority of the cook. I'm still fairly new to fire management and trying to keep the flames low. So I did the best that I could. Let's go ahead. 
Yep, and again, doesn't look super crispy on the edges. I think I did really good on the fire management. This is probably the best brisket I've done so far. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Fat is perfectly rendered. Mm. Okay, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. To be honest, since I was running a low fire, I was kind of concerned that it was gonna have like a dirty smoke flavor, but like the smoke flavor is perfect. If you found this video helpful, then you have to watch the next video on your screen because I'll show you how to avoid every mistake I made on my first ever brisket cook so you don't ruin barbecue for your family like I did.